Singularity. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Singularity One on One. Singularity One on One is a regular podcast feature of Singularity Weblog where you can go and listen to it or download it in full. My name is Nicola, aka Socrates, and as always, I will be the man with the questions. Today, for the second time in a row, my guest on the show would be Natasha Vitamore. Natasha Vitamore is so many things that it is very hard to describe her in a couple of sentences, but she is an artist, she is a PhD researcher, she is a designer, and um, I have invited her today in her capacity of what the New York Times calls the first female philosopher of transhumanism, because the topic of our conversation today would be uh, transhumanism one-on-one. So hopefully we would go through some of the basics of transhumanism, some of the misconceptions about it, some of the ethics connected to the major issues related to transhumanism, uh, and finally we were going to talk about some of the most recent developments. So without further ado, welcome Natasha. It's very nice to have you back on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and I certainly appreciate your interest in this topic. It's a, a timely topic since so much has gone on the past decade um, within the realms of transhumanism, so it's good to revisit it. It's good to knuckle down and, and get some of the uh, original ideas and historical links. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think uh, that's, that's, the, that's the reason why it, it is a very timely topic, and I believe it's going to be more and more timely as time goes by, and it would come and be more and more into the popular mainstream media. But unfortunately, right now, I, I think that the way I see it, it's very... Uh, mainstream has a very sort of dystopic, Frankensteinian, apocalyptic kind of uh, perception of transhumanism. You know, there's always something going wrong, there's always a Frankensteinian effect, there's always ugliness, there's always death, and it always ends up bad, pretty much, m most of the time. So, let's start in the very beginning here, and perhaps we should start with uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, which is, of course, also the first uh, work of uh, science fiction uh, ever, uh, written by another woman. Uh, I think she was 19 years old at the time, actually. So le let's start with that. Is Frankenstein the first uh, sort of proto-transhumanist work of science fiction or of, of any writing, in your view? I think it's the the first in the Western world that actually um, caused a stir, um, ignited some fury, some curiosity, certainly took a look at um, mechanizing the human body um, in a, a fairly serious and uh, strong narrative of both interest and excitement of what could possibly occur as well as fear and um, rejection of the downside of it. And it certainly set in, into place uh, part of the uh, dystopic view of uh, altering human physiology through technology. So I, I think that it is quite profound in that way and it's, it's a good read too. Uh, but I think if we look back further we'll see Galam, uh, the story of Galam, we'll see mm -hmm. um, edifices uh, designed to uh, worship throughout rituals and religions and I think that if we go back over time we'll see um, links to um, more anthropological research and archaeology about the different bodily forms that were um, put together as a, a sub-personality or whether even if it was more uh, mystical or religious based, there was always this drive of, of a human to look outside his or her body and wonder what it would be like to alter that. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but as far as transhumanism is concerned, I think Frankenstein is probably <laughs> very relevant. Yes, and, and so in that sense, do you think that, uh, I mean, pretty much Mary Shelley set the tone of a, this apocalyptic uh, sort of uh, pessimistic in a way, even if you will, view of the future and most science fiction following her has been having this kind of a slant, if you will. So do you think that she did more damage than good in a way? Possibly, possibly. I think, you know, many of our, our favorite science fiction writers um, who are indeed transhumanists in scope and many are self-proclaimed transhumanists 
um, have written some very scary narratives that have uh, frightened the the general public, those who've read it. But many of them have been made into movies, especially Philip K. Dick. He wasn't a self-professed transhumanist, but he certainly was looking at a lot of the issues that Mm -hmm. has been discussed for decades within the realm of human-machine interaction, human-computer interaction, um, human enhancement, uh, biotechnology, etc. So I, I think that it that whole spectrum has done a little bit of damage, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, however, the other side of the coin is it's done a tremendous amount of good because so, some really uh, well-written science fiction stories have enormous mathematical um, credence and um, uh, elements of physics and astronomy and um, uh, cosmology to such a degree that those writers are, are highly schooled. I mean, they know what they're talking about. So the stories may have a frightening human narrative, but if we look at it from a different perspective of maybe space exploration or accelerating technology, mm-hmm. there is um, a bit of truth to it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's good in that way. But I, I think we more than anything, we need balance. We need some good romantic stories, some comedy, some insightful narratives that show how the human can overcome odds and not be <laughs> blown up. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so, so let me ask you, um, do you think that uh, ever since Mary Shelley in a way, and especially today, uh, transhumanism has had this kind of a negative connotation associated with it that we sort of has to have to always confront. In a lot of ways, but it depends on the circle of of individuals or media uh, publication that you're referring to. For example, in academics, transhumanism is a threat to postmodernism, so it's a bit feared, and it's the you know a distant cousin of modernism mm-hmm. and scientism, or said to be. It's that's not entirely true, but it is packaged in that way, so it's brought some concern. I think that, that we have an opportunity now to break through the postmodernist wall and show how transhumanism has a great potential to offer solutions to many of the problems we face today. Um, rather than complaining about the future, let's get in there and do something about it. So I think transhumanism offers that uh, perspective. Um, I think that in the circle of bioethics, uh, if you read the material of Francis Fukuyama or Leanne Cass or uh, even Gibbon or um, outside biotechnology, Bill Joy, the big article in Wired some years ago, uh, you'll see an incredible disdain for um, altering the body or even genetic engineering, stem cell cloning, um, whole body prosthetics, the different areas that have really helped so many people. Mm-hmm. If Old I remember off the top of my head, Bill Joy was the person who said why the future doesn't need us. And then Francis Fukuyama uh, pretty much called fr- uh, transhumanism the most dangerous idea. Yes, out that's there. true. That's true on both counts. Let's start with the last one because I have an interesting little tale. Yeah. I was invited to give a talk um, at the World Trade Center about mm-hmm. five years ago on sustainability. It was a big sustainable conference and most everyone there was of course talking about environmental sustainability and Bruce Mao was the keynote and as you know he did um, the major exhibition on change, massive change, which is so phenomenal. If you haven't seen it, it's a must to go take a look at. Perhaps you can give your viewers a link. Um, Anyway, so I was giving a talk on sustainable humans and the sustainable body Mm -hmm. and the auditorium was full and uh, Many people were annoyed and many people were overjoyed that we would consider sustaining our own viability, our own lifespan, our own essence, our own brains. And that could be something that, oh, why not? Why 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 didn't we think about this before? The old saying, we back up our computers, why aren't we backing up ourselves, our memory, that is, and in all aspects of our physiology. Um, So... I think it's very interesting when you think of uh, the comment that transhumanism is the world's most dangerous idea. I spoke to Bruce Mao about that phrase, and he said, good, let them say that. It'll bring more attention to it. And so there you, we talk about the dystopic attitude. does have some aspects of positive return. There's some positive intellectual and emotional capital there because it at least puts a a pointer on it. And if we can um, just defend the ideas with 
a certain you know rigor and and um, calm rather than defensiveness, I think that um, it's a good thing. So yes. Um, Transhumanism as the world's most dangerous idea is a silly notion. Of course, there's more dangerous things. Um, I think it's the world's most um, wonderful idea as far as a worldview. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it actually offers some hope, and it's not based on you know fighting and wars and and discrediting others. And Bill Joy's um, summation about us returning to the past, the native village, and and um, relinquishing the future and uh, it's, it's a blessed thought. It certainly has a certain charm to it. Let's stop. We have enough. Let's go back. Um, but in all reality, it's impossible. It so, kind of reminds me to Voltaire's noble savage concept, in a way. I live on Voltaire Street, or Voltaire Avenue. Oh, very interesting. <laughs> I think we bought this house because of it was on Voltaire Avenue. <laughs> but anyway, these are very good points in... I think laughing about them and having fun with them is, is a good thing because it shows that we're not affected by them in an adverse way and we're not mm-hmm. frightened by, by the criticisms that it gives us an opportunity to respond in ways that um, not only educate but question our own motivations. Critical thinking is one of the, the tenets of transhumanism mm-hmm. and I think it's one that we need to keep close to our breast. And, and, and I think our society and our civilization, uh, especially in North America, can definitely benefit if, if we embrace a lot more critical thinking. Um, I think it's desperately needed. But let's, let's uh, roll back the tape a little bit and just start with a, with a very simple um, concept of transhumanism. What is transhumanism in your view? In my view, transhumanism is a worldview. Uh, in my view, transhumanism, well, you can cut that out, but it's just kind of poetic and cute. Um, transhumanism means, in its, its most fundamental way, and as crisply as I can say it, it's just elevating the human condition. <clears throat> and by elevating, I mean not saying there's anything seriously wrong with being human. Of course not. We are human, and we are alive, and thank goodness we are. Every day, let's remember to thank ourselves for being healthy and, and to be thankful, appreciative of all that we have. However, there's too many problems that go on and have continued for far too long. Transhuman is an evolution from being exclusively human in our biology and therefore in our consciousness to becoming um, trans-biological, to merging with technology, i.e. machines, and Uh, improving the physiological performance of our bodies, meaning that our bodies are continually uh, uh, mutating in ways that are um, cause disease. Uh, And I think that's pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. So transhumanism, by its most concise way, is that we want to be more than just human in our biology. Mm -hmm. So... It's very simple, actually. It means, you know, and then the question here is, well, what's wrong with being human and you're turning into a cyborg and this is a horrible thing, we should respect our biology. Well, of course we respect our biology. Of course I respect my biology. But the point is that our biology is dying off. Every day after puberty, we start degenerating. And we're trying to slow that down. I think anyone in the medical profession is is doing his or her best to slow that down so why is it an awful thing to take that seriously Mm -hmm. outside medicine so you wonder if some of the criticisms about transhumanism um, are the gumption that any human outside the medical field would dare to intervene with his or her biology Mm -hmm. I'll come back to that point in a second but before that I just want to differentiate transhumanism from or being transhuman from being cyborg Uh, what are the differences uh, this is a really good point. I covered it. Yeah, by the way, I am a. I did it. Uh, I am Dr. Vita Moore. <laughs> oh, congratulations! Thank you, thank you. Uh, it was a great ride. Loved it every moment, every tedious and delightful moment of it. It was great. So, a cyborg, according to Manfred Klein, is an augmented body for the purpose of existing in non uh, non planetary environments. He came up with the idea of the cyborg in relationship to space exploration. Uh, 
So we can exist out in space in our human bodies over a longer period of time because anti-gravity and some of the, the elements of the, of the sun mm-hmm. rays will damage our bodies. So he came up with the idea that we need to have um, an, an augmented or enhanced body in order for space exploration. Alternatively, Donna Haraway took the term and turned it into a feminist manifesto. Mm-hmm. And that's a totally different concept. In my work, I refer to Manfred Klein because it, it, it deals with the body and augmentation for dealing with the environment. Because our environment has changed over the eons, we do have to alter our physiology for our health and maintenance. One obvious example is sun exposure. Uh, because of the, some of the environmental situations that have occurred over the, the past hundreds of years, uh, there's a higher rate of a skin uh, cancer, melanoma, or basal cell carcinoma. And so we have to protect our skin. And so we put on um, sun protection on a daily basis and going out in the sun. Well, that's one way we're enhancing our body. We're enhancing our skin and protecting it. Mm -hmm. So I think that the cyborg directly relates to the transhumanism and the transhuman. And I consider it a a cousin. But it's a different concept. The cyborg is not self-directing evolution. And it's not self-directed enhancement. And there's no mention in cyborg theory about... um, psychology, about philosophy, about um, living longer in the future, whereas the transhuman, by its very definition, it's about human transition in altering our biology for living longer and um, improving or elevating the human performance, both in our physiology and in our cognition. Mm -hmm. Natasha, I know that uh, you have written extensively uh, uh, for a while uh, on the topic of transhumanism. So, for example, just one example that comes to my mind is the transhumanist art statement that you published in 1983. But for those of our viewers uh, who are new to the topic of transhumanism, what would be some of the most foundational texts or works that, that they need to sort of lay down the the basics, the foundation of transhumanism as a philosophy? I think the most important texts to read are not the most recent books written, but it's going back to uh, some of the consequential texts. Max Moore, in his writing of the philosophy of transhumanism, I think is very important to read and to understand that transhumanism is a worldview and the philosophy of extropy is a type of transhumanism. So the philosophy of extropy is a codified philosophy. It's a transhumanist philosophy. But um, Max also wrote the philosophy of transhumanism. So he wrote both. Transhumanism, large worldview, large philosophical scope, extropy as a specific philosophy of transhumanism. So I think anything that Max Moore has written is... um, very important, and all you need to do is Google it. Um, it's all over the internet, or go to his website. I think that reading uh, Eric Drexler is, I would say, second uh, of importance here, if we're going to put it in a hierarchy, because Eric wrote about nanotechnology, but he didn't just write about it as a technologist. He wrote about it in more of a philosophical narrative that like is... A visionary. Yes, yes. Oh, so important. Um, the visionary ideas um, encapsulate the whole emotion of transhumanism to want to create a world that is safer, um, more abundance, uh, more, more logical use of technology like molecular manufacturing and molecular nanotechnology to mm-hmm. resolve some of the issues that we're facing. Uh, so in that regard, it's a highly um, substantial book. It's a, a seminal book and um, a good read. Another one is Robert Ettinger. I think that, that his book on immortality is very good. Even though I, I don't use the term immortality and I don't agree with the concept of immortality, I think it's, it's a, a good book. Um, I think that anything that Damien Broderick wrote, like The Spike, is an early singularity book, and it's very seldom mentioned, but it's a good book, and I think Damien Broderick should be credited with having been one of the, the early uh, writers on the singularity. And, of course, Werner Vinge, mm-hmm. uh, who came up with the concept of the technological singularity. Yes. Um, I think any book by Roy Walford on nutrition, not CR, but re- nutrition is good. Um, I think that... Um, 
my book, uh, Create, Recreate, which was self-published in the 1980s it's, um, and then revisited in the 1990s, it's all about film, uh, not too much music, but it's about film, narratives, um, design, uh, storytelling uh, from the artist design perspective. Uh, about these stories about culture. It's so, in a nutshell, it's about culture dealing through the arts and media design and how we're looking at ideas. Another book, speaking of that, and I, I, I used one of his stories, and it is Carl Sagan, mm -hmm. uh, Science is a Candle in the Dark, The yes. Demon Haunted World. Brilliant book. It's about critical thinking. Mm -hmm. But uh, Carl Sagan wrote it in a way that it's this lovely narrative again. Um, Arthur C. Clarke, his, his writing is, is, is great. Marvin Minsky on um, the mind. Mind children. Uh, yes, mind children. Um, it's, not, it's, it's a little bit more difficult, but it's a great book. I think Stuart Brand with The Long Now is a good book. I'm looking over at my bookshelf. I've got three bookshelves against my wall. I wish <laughs> we were facing that way. Um, I don't have a shoe fetish. I have a book fetish. Um, <laughs> any uh, Robots by Daniel Ishkov in France is a great book. Oh, Beyond Modern Sculpture by Jack Burnham is excellent. Uh, Andy Maya is a good read as far as enhancement and early ideas about enhancement, although I'm not in his book. We were trains in the night, and, and I was not included in it, but um, that's okay. Um, I think Andy Clark is a really good writer on cyborg uh, and natural born cyborg minds, technology, and the future of human intelligence. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really crisp book to read. Um, now here we have to get into the other side of the coin, Francis Fukuyama, who we just spoke of, uh, our post-human future. Uh, it's a good read to see the other side of the issues and yeah. to see a little bit of the ridiculousness in assumption making about biotechnology and our dignity being located in our genes uh, rather than in, in the human um, drive to, to solve problems. I think that's maybe a better way to look at human dignity. Um, of course, Ray Kurzweil, The Singularity is Near. Oh, here's a book that is great, Nanomedicine by Robert Friedis. Mm -hmm. It's all about nanotechnology as nanomedicine, meaning little small robots going into the body and, and clearing up, um, cleaning up cell damage uh, from disease and um, erosion. So that's a really good book. A difficult one, but the beginning of it is, is delightful to read. Kevin Kelly. Love Kevin Kelly. I think anything Kevin Kelly's written, again, it's not specifically transhumanist, but it's the whole world that we live in. And um, he gave um, a keynote at one of our conferences, one of our Extra Institute conferences. So there's a, a number of books to read. Um, I have a book coming out. Um, I'm co-editor on it, and it has... I think this may be one of the best books to read, um, not to toot my own horn, but as um, <laughs> with critical thinking, I think it is. Uh, it's called uh, The Transhumanist Reader, mm -hmm. uh, and it has 40 authors in it, I think 40 or maybe 42, uh, whose early seminal essays cover the topics of transhumanism. So we have this, this rich book, which will be an amazing resource for readers, not only for students who are studying philosophy, technology, science, and culture, mm -hmm. but also in the public domain, anyone who wants to revisit um, the original ideas. Well, I'll definitely, for example, personally want to get a copy of the transhumanist reader. Uh, is it out already, or is it coming no, out soon? No, we had a little. No, sorry, it's, we had a little delay. Um, I was finishing my dissertation, and then a big move to Scottsdale. Um, but it'll be out hopefully in the spring. So that's just a few months away after the winter, and I will send you a copy as oh. a gift. My pleasure. Oh, thank you. That would be fantastic. <laughs> All right. Um, so. Uh, Perhaps now is the time to tell us a little bit about your dissertation. What was the topic and, and so on? How, how did that impact on your work with the book and, uh, and so on? Well, I, I think what I wanted to do was to write on transhumanism. And that was inappropriate um, as far as uh, my advisors were concerned. Because if you are deeply involved in, in working with the beginnings of a concept, an idea, and then you write your dissertation on it, it can, can come off as looking um, autobiographical uh -huh. and lacking scholarship and, and 
the rigor that's needed, the objectivity. Mm -hmm. I, I think I could have done that. Um, because I have written about uh, deconstructing transhumanism. I'm looking at all, all the problems within it. Mm -hmm. But um, I decided to write on human enhancement and take a look at the, um, the issue of the transhuman, posthuman. Mm -hmm. So my book is called Life, I mean, my dissertation is called Life Expansion. So I'm not just looking at life extension which is one of the basics of transhumanism, but I'm looking at life expansion, which has become one of the basics of transhumanism. And I think this fits in into your interview of me because we, we change over time, of course, and as technology keeps on advancing, our ideas need to do likewise. So many years ago, when we discussed life extension, which is not a new concept, obviously, if we go back to um, Fedorov and Finot and... Uh, the enormous work, the body of work that was done in life extension, even going back to the Taoists mm -hmm. with alchemy, um, there's always been this, this urge for you know, living longer. Mm -hmm. um, but in my dissertation, I look at life expansion, and specifically that term because it's not just extending biological life, it's expanding consciousness, mm -hmm. our identity, personal identity, onto non-biological systems or substrates or platforms, such as in um, an upload or a whole brain emulation or substrate independent mind as, as um, determined by Randall Cohn. So these are the ideas that have gotten more currency. And one element here in our Transhumanism 101 is that the idea is to stay up on knowledge, mm -hmm. to be critical about where we're obtaining our knowledge and to be able to have the skills to decipher what is viable and what needs to be worked on or revisited. So I spent a lot of time arguing that in my, in my uh, dissertation. Um, so, so I look at base. So it's Sorry. not only that we have to extend uh, our duration, but you actually, we actually want to expand our capabilities. It's not merely, uh, uh, you know, e extending one of the factors, that is to say time, but extending everything, expanding yes. everything. Yes, and who would have guessed the internet? Who would have guessed we'd be having five avatars in Second Life? I mean, this is all new. This was not known 20 years ago. Maybe it was written about in, in some science fiction, mm -hmm. certainly, or maybe people m amused about it, but we actually are doing that. You and I are, are communicating virtually, and we're looking at images of ourselves. So what is not to say that we might have several different personas existing in, in different substrates, different platforms, and different um, realities like real time and virtual. Absolutely. So I, I, that's why I use the term life expansion. Uh, I, I and really like that the issues term. of life and death, which is a whole area that I would love to talk to you about at length. But um, for this segment, we want to, you know, touch on what the transhumanism mm -hmm. is. And I think that the importance of our discussing this right now is that there's little room for dogma because we have to constantly be re-educating ourselves. And that's nothing new. Um, greatest thinkers in the world have always said you learn from your mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, uh, if I remember your... your uh, um, yeah, if I remember Max Moore, when I interviewed him uh, on Singularity One on One, his uh, major message was question everything, uh, which is uh, very much uh, in keeping with what you just said. So let me ask you this though: um, Why is it and 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 why is there so much fear of transhumanism? Why is it the most dangerous idea? Why are people yeah. intuitively or for whatever reason always pushing away from it and always so fearful? I think there's a number of different reasons. I I will send you a copy, and maybe you can maybe you can put it up on deconstructing mm -hmm. transhumanism. Let's put something positive up and something deconstructing it. In my research, when I went about trying to find why there are these problems, and who's doing what, what's the the um, where is the idea, where are the ideas coming from that are are negative, and why are they so negative, and um, Part of it's our fault. I take responsibility you know, for my own um, contribution to um, maybe some of the problems. Um, and that's a good place to start, looking within and then look, you know, you look at yourself, what are you doing? Then you look at your neighbors and your family and then you look at your culture. And I look at the culture of transhumanism and I see some problems. Okay. 
any people don't like change. That's the simple answer. <laughs> Basically, people, I mean, we humans, we like to nestle in our, in our, in our houses, in our create our nests and nestle in. And we like to have our families. We like to know who we love and know who we want to stay away from. We want to have our job. We want our retirement. And we want to go, go play golf or, like me, ski down the Telluride mountain slope at retirement. That's not going to happen for me. And when people realize that it may not happen for them, that their dreams of their little community or their little home and hearth could be disrupted at any time, they get scared. We've seen too many wars. We've seen too many problems. And we're frightened about these types of change that could bring another major um, What about the argument of human nature that, you know, our human nature is such and such and transhumanism basically negates uh, the very essence of being human. Now, you can have a, a sort of a religious uh, idea of what it means to be human, but you, it doesn't necessarily have to be religious. Uh, you know, it could be more, uh, uh, you know, philosophical in some sense, but in either case, there's this fear that we're losing what it means to be human. Right, and it, it could be even economics, you know? Supply and demand, you know, let's, uh oh, let's not go over there. There may not be enough supply and demand. Wanting to be safe, wanting to be financially safe, socially safe, um, uh, certainly um, environmentally safe. I think science fiction um, is one of the problems. Rather than the science fiction writers offering solutions to problems um, more times than not, there are uh, problems created from technology. So that's catapulted a lot of fear. So we have number one, a basic innate human characteristic of fear of change. Um, and um, the main media that we go to for our narratives is film. Film is still number one. Gaming is coming up to be sure, but film reaches more people and TV mm -hmm. as well. And most of the stories are written by people who want a paycheck and they, horror, fear sells. So yeah. does sex and love, but horror and fear sells. Um, so that's one thing. It's the mimetic engineering on the part of the fear syndrome that is um, catapulted a, a bit of a, a negative interpretation of transhumanism. Another thing is the, um, the idea of perfection, which is um, an anomaly and an, a misinterpretation, misconception. Mm -hmm. There is no nothing written, there's no view within the transhumanist scope that any human is looking for perfection. And I'll tell you why. From, from the transhumanist perspective. Mm -hmm. Perfection means stasis. You stop. Absolutely. There's no growing. Absolutely. There's no improvement. Once you reach yeah. perfection, that's it. <laughs> you might as well say goodnight. Get your award and, and you know, turn you out the light. You can't change anything after that, yes. Exactly. So yeah. it's anything but it's transhumanist. It's death in a way. Is it yeah, exactly. It's death for yeah. creativity and innovation. So um, transhumanists are not looking for perfection. Many humans are looking for perfection. The term perfection stems from, you know, the Aristotle's view of the, the golden mean and the, and the perfect beauty and the perfect mm -hmm. aesthetics. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a misconception. But um, so that's one thing, the, the desire to be perfect. No, we don't desire to be perfect. Not we. I'm not speaking for other transhumanists. I don't desire to be perfect. Um, I desire to, to keep on growing and learning and improving and elevating my own condition. Um, so instead so that's of perfection, it's a, it's, a, it's a desire for improvement, ongoing, constant, in a way, everlasting. It's like the Tao oh. or the Do in, in Eastern philosophy, of the path, the journey that basically never ends. Yeah, it's the praxis. Yeah. The praxis, the, the, the within that, the work, you know, it's the... It's the Travel along the way, you know, knowing where you're going or, or you know, which course can change, but enjoy the ride, enjoy the journey. Another reason why transhumanism has been um, gotten a, a bit of a bad rap is because of the issue of biotechnology and ethics. And in the 1970s, that's when the bioethics and ethics really took hold. And it was based on genetic engineering, some mm -hmm. discoveries of genetic engineering. Mm -hmm. And MIT, an article and work done there, and the New York Times published... Um, an article and the public was not aware that this genetic engineering was being done and everyone freaked out. And then you start ha seeing the bioethics councils building. And um, so it was this fear syndrome that anyone tamper with the human genome, with human life, um, 
It's the same type of fear with um, uh, you know, the abortion, which is, is, is not a comparison. I certainly am not for abortion by any stretch of the imagination, nor am I opposed to it. Sometimes things have to be done um, for, one, for a reason, and I think that's a personal choice. But mm -hmm. death on any scale is, is, is a very tragic thing, mm -hmm. and the, the death of even... Um, a potential life form to me is sad and and uh, ought not to happen. Um, let me let me ask you here, perhaps uh, just again to roll back a little bit and clear out. Um, you've mentioned the word posthuman, and I just want to make sure it's it's clarified. Uh, what's the difference between transhuman and posthuman in your view? In my view, the difference between transhuman and posthuman is that the transhuman is a transition in becoming something other than human. Mm -hmm. And uh, in our physiology, let's say, and the posthuman is a state that's beyond human. So the posthuman is not biological, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the transhuman can be biological, can be semi-biological, can be, you know, it's a transition. Little biological, medium biological, getting less, less, less biological to becoming post-human. And the post-human can exist at the same time as the transhuman and the human. Uh, it, it, it all depends on uh, the technology and the, the methodology for creating um, that type of life structure. Now, the, the, the caveat here is that in order to be post-human or even late-stage transhuman, it would require um, the, uh, the skill of mind uploading or copying and transferring the, the, mm -hmm. the functions of the brain because if our mind is who we are, what we do, and the brain is the, the process that, that creates mind, then we have to be able to understand the brain and its neurology and mm -hmm. all those neurons running around and forming synapses and whatnot. That's very important to understand, and it's one of the most interesting areas of research being performed, um, and it's only going to grow. Again, going back to what we said earliest on uh, when I gave the talk on that um, uh, World Trade Center Conference on Sustainability, why are we not backing up ourselves? So that's a, a big area that's mm -hmm. being developed. So in becoming post-human, you have to have that. You have to have the backup. And therein, you would um, put the... The workings of the brain in a different type of system. Mm -hmm. So, so let me ask you then: How, as transhumanists, how do we change the public perception from one that's largely negative or full of fear to ones that's full of, you know, enthusiasm and and and, and optimism? Excellent question. Thank you for asking it. I've given that a lot of thought, and what I realized is that it has to start at home, as we said earlier, that I have to do what I can to, um, to make my work um, represent not just my own ego and you know, ideas as an artist and designer, but to respect the environment, the culture in, with, in which I, I work, and um, that is perhaps not being a crazy, wild, you know, flippant person, but taking responsibility. And, and I think the, the idea of self-responsibility comes in there. So what I've, not everyone has to do it. It's just what I need to do. Um, I try to make all my work have some kind of positive outcome. Mm -hmm. I try to be as clear and honest in my work as far as not being Pollyanna. Um, I wear sometimes rose-colored glasses, but I try to constantly um, question what I'm doing. And, uh, and I think one of the most important things is to look at the time frame in which the work is being done. For example, what I'm doing is very different than what I did 20 years ago. You know, then I was making films on psychology, on, on um, identity, and uh, you know, sculpting my bodies to rocks and uh, performing inside volcanoes and whatnot because I was a performance artist and filmmaker. So when I got more into design and future studies and all that, I started becoming more theoretical about what I was doing. So my latest work and the way I'm doing it, I think, is by example. I have a new project called H Plus TV, and it's going to start very soon. It just hit Facebook um, yesterday, 
and it's it's going to be a slow start, but it's going to hit. And it's a series of six episodes on the future, and it deals with um, ideas mm-hmm. that um, need to be discussed. Uh, and the point of this is that what I noticed is many um, universities, many um, startups, many organizations are very quick to get their entrepreneurial project, and that's fabulous. We need so much of that. However, there is not enough attention being paid to the history and the links of information and knowledge or the philosophical, cultural, theoretical aspects of it. Mm-hmm. So you have people just learning the technology or doing their you know, next big splash without having any referential information or to carry on a, an intelligent conversation about these things and um, outside their specific area, I should say, in, in all respect. Um, so the six-part series, H Plus TV, is I'm looking at six specific areas of transhumanism, and I discuss some of the issues there that I notice, and then after that, there is a online discussion uh, between three and five discussants who are experts in the area to take a look at some of the issues that have not been discussed. It'll end up as a book, of course, and... Um, I think it's quite wonderful. I'm, I'm very excited about it, and I enjoy doing it. I got a small grant from Terrasome Foundation for it, and it's going through Humanity Plus and ES Design, my company, and uh, uh, Tele Accelerate is the location where it's going to be online. So that's, that's great. Very interesting. Thank you. I, I think it's one thing that can be done is is to uh, just deal with what is. I get a little bit frustrated when I see um, so much goth and so much um, negativity and, and dystopic views or, you know, um, we already have plenty of that. Let's, let's you know, <laughs> focus let's on the positive a, message. the windows and have a little sunshine and, yes. you know, we can just be as wild and crazy as ever and sexual and sensual and exciting. But um, I think that we need to re- realize that the, the time frame we're in means that we have to be a bit responsible, you know, mm-hmm. just, just a bit. Let me ask you this then, though, but because you mentioned H plus TV. So is it starting with semantics and how far, far further does it have to go? Because, um, you know, people in the transhumanist community are often avoiding the term, for example, immortality, but they talk about radical life extension instead. And the same with even the term transhumanism as of the last few years has been perhaps been replaced or attempted to be replaced with the H plus kind of an idea. So how much of that sort of positive change in public perceptions is semantic? Okay, I'm going to answer this in a different way, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, These two examples are not corollary. Mm -hmm. But they're very good examples, and I think that you don't intend them to be corollary. I think that you're just pointing them out as two obvious ones. So let's deal with the first one, immortality. The term immortality means uh, never dying. That's not possible. We'd have no idea what the future holds. All we can do is the best with what we've got and to keep on discovering and inventing and exploring. Um, The idea of radical life extension pertains to biology. We're radically extending life uh, that is biological. And how Mm -hmm. we do that is why I use the term life expansion. We don't know which mediums or platforms we could exist on uh, with our consciousness, our personal identity, who we are. Uh, So I think the term radical life extension is the first step. It's very transhumanist because it means extending as long as we can as we're you know, using nanomedicine and, and regenerative medicine and augmenting ourselves and, and adding to our bodies and becoming more um, synergetic with technology. The term immortality also goes back to the alchemist, and it, it has a great narrative, great story, but it's, it's not what transhumanism is about. We're mm-hmm. not seeking immortality. We're seeking radical life extension, and then we don't know what after that. But we, we, we see the, the writing on the wall, and one thing's leading to another, so it's wiser to at least know what could occur and to work with it than to hide from it, pretend it doesn't exist like the big monster in the sky. So that's why that's used. The other um, issue brought up was H plus versus transhumanism. Mm -hmm. That has a little story to it. I'm on the fence with this one. 
first, I love the term transhumanism. It is exactly what it's saying, but it's not so precise meaning humanism because humanism does have some particulars that I don't value, although it has many aspects that I do value. So it's not humanism trans, it means more human transition. Um, humanism um, and the Enlightenment offered many insights into, into human nature and, and philosophy and culture. And I think postmodernism was right to kind of crack down on that and deconstruct it a bit. Mm -hmm. But we shouldn't throw it out. You know, there are some good things. And I think that's where postmodernism makes a mistake. Rather than throwing out, say, oh, humanism is so bad and modernism is so bad, let's take the best and implement it and then create more. And I think that's what transhumanism does. Mm -hmm. um, now, the H plus thing, that, that I didn't like it when it first happened, to be frank. Now it doesn't bother me at all. I guess because I was an early... Um, early involved in transhumanism that um, I thought it was phony. I thought it was dishonest to like just, okay, let's hide that word because it's a bad word and let's put H plus because it doesn't, you know. <laughs> I thought that at first I was like, come on, you guys, just, you know, let's, let's do some creative mimetic engineering and, 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 and work towards making this better understood rather than to put a Band-Aid on it. But now that I look at it from the other side of it, I see that the Band-Aid was, it's okay, it's okay. H plus is, is a good name, but it's not, it doesn't replace transhumanism. Mm -hmm. H plus organization um, replaced another organization that um, had gotten a bit of a, a questionable reputation not because of any one person or any one thing. It just, it, it became too politicized. Mm -hmm. So instead of dealing with transhumanism, it was dealing more with um, some arguments um, that were political. Although that organization, WTA, did some fabulous work in academics. Um, James Hughes, Nick Bostrom, they did some really great work. Um, so I have to tip my hat to them for what they did. However, the politicizing was not so good because it... It wasn't always correct. Uh, it was a misinterpretation of different people's views. But anyway, I think that the long and the short of his H plus is fine. It's cute. It works. It's H plus, and it looks good. And then, if you want more intellectual rigor, then you get into transhumanism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's 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 kind of it's like a text. You know, I think if we look at it that way, it's kind of a symbol, which is a quick text, mm -hmm. rather than getting into the more um, theoretical, philosophical um, aspects of transhumanism. It's like a shorthand for transhumanism. Yeah. yeah. I see. Very, very, very interesting. So, Natasha, you, you already mentioned, um, un unfortunately, we're kind of approaching towards the end of our interview here. Uh, so I'll, I'll rush quickly, perhaps, through the last uh, three questions that I have. You already mentioned that uh, in the spring, uh, one of the books is coming out, which is called uh, The Transhumanist Reader. Is there anything else that we should be looking forward to? Any other books? Yes. Okay, let's, let's look at this. Let's get, um, get back to the, the issue of, of the, the program is, you know, the basics of transhumanism mm -hmm. and what we can do now to learn about it mm -hmm. in a world where there is just so much information and misinformation and, and even Wikipedia yeah. doesn't have it right. I don't yeah. know who's on it. Someone is manipulating that. So information gets manipulated and it's not always correct and oftentimes it's to pro promote one idea over another or one person over another. So it's got to shuffle through all this stuff. So yes, the transhumanist reader, it's, um, the full name is the transhumanist reader, classical and contemporary essays on the science, technology and philosophy of the future human. Mm -hmm. That I say, I would say is the best book to read. I think that um, Human Enhancement by Bostrom is a good book. I think James Hughes' book is good. Um, but as far as the latest information and what's going on, books are a little bit outdated, aren't they? I mean, it seems like blogs are getting far more attention and uh, Facebook. Um, I think that what we need to do is look for ideas and people doing incredible work. Uh, my TV show, H Plus TV, I think will be a great primer for transhumanism. Mm -hmm. I think um, 
that um, some of the uh, top sites to go to are Kurtzville AI because it, it always has the latest information about technology and the issues of transhumanism. I think Terrorism Foundation is another great place to go to find um, ideas about um, mind files, mm -hmm. you know, dealing with co um, what we can do right now to copy our personality and back it up. We can't copy our brain and back it up yet, but at least we can um, record our behaviors. Um, and your program, I think, is fabulous. These, these documentary online uh, projects such as yours that deal with people one-on-one, -on -one, this is so important because then you're getting the latest information. You're getting to know the person a little bit and all of our quirks and um, stumblings and whatnot as we're trying to answer the question. It's, it's more revealing and it's, it's more lovely and honest, I think. Um, so that's good. I think my dissertation, I have to say, it would be a very good reference because it's on life expansion and it's looking at the artistic design base, um, transhuman, posthuman. So I'm not looking only at the science and technology. I'm looking at the culture. Mm -hmm. And one of the chapters in my dissertation is titled The Contested Culture. And I look at the whole issues of where we are and, and um, what conflicts that we can overcome. And I have uh, interviews with some of the leading thinkers in science and technology and bio arts and DIY bio and all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's um, the methodology is hands-on interview empirical study, which I think is always um, good uh, for um, getting in, in, in the flow. Yes. Uh, um, I, I can attest for that myself uh, a little bit, uh, perhaps. Uh, so, so let me ask you, for those of our viewers and listeners who want to find out more about you and your work, for example, the upcoming H Plus TV series and stuff like that, what's the best place they can go and look for that? The best place is probably my website, and I don't have the best website, and I apologize to your viewers. <laughs> I haven't put up a WordPress yet, and it's still in <laughs> 20th century uh, format, but I kind of like that, frankly. It it, um, I'll change it sometime soon. But I think uh, www.natasha.cc is the, is the best place to go. Um, uh, another great place to go is uh, Humanity Plus's website, which is www.humanityplus.org. H Plus Magazine is a great place to go. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Facebook. Befriend me on Facebook. Mm -hmm. I... I usually put something up that's either about my dog or about my work. Um, <laughs> and I think that um, we need to get more involved in the arts and gaming and multimedia and the different mm -hmm. events that are going on. I don't, uh, there's no event that I can recommend at the moment. Um, there's just conferences. Uh, oh, the, the artistic events, yes, I will give plugs to some artistic events. I recommend Airs Electronica in Europe as probably the best place to go to learn about the, uh, the sciences and technologies of narrative. I recommend Seagraph, of course. Your viewers are probably very familiar with Seagraph. Yeah. Uh, Singularity uh, University has yeah. some great projects. I, I would say that your, your uh, name is often being used as a headliner for a number of those conferences. So perhaps you can just give us the short list of, uh, of some of the ones that you support. Okay, the uh, upcoming events that I support, there's a conference in Croatia right now on future humans. There's the Mutamorphous Conference that will be in Prague. Mm -hmm. I highly support that. There's, um, uh, let's see, um, we hope to have a, Com Humanity Plus hopes to have an event at Stanford University and San Francisco and uh, Parsons uh, New School of Design coming up, uh, also in Beijing. Uh, but as far as the multimedia arts, film, uh, conferences, events, uh, Gogbot in Europe is a great arts festival. And um, that's really fun. I gave a keynote at it. I think it was last year or the year before. And uh, that, that's really great. But the only projects in the United States where I'm from that I really support right now or that I do support are um, at Parsons, the New School for Design, Pratt, um, University of Advancing Technology is a great, great location for events. Mm -hmm. um, in Los Angeles, specifically, a thumbs up to Easy TV. 
Mm-hmm. It is a great place to connect and learn about um, ideas. Michael Masucci there uh, runs it, and he's, he's spoken at many transhumanist conferences. He's in the know. Um, L.A. also, let's see, um, um, the 18th Street Art Complex has some great events. And um, that's pretty much it. And, and, and Natasha, my, my last question is always the same, actually, on all of my interviews, and that is, what would you like the sort of single most important message that viewers and listeners take away from this interview with you today? What would you like that to be? <sighs> Get creative about the future. Be healthy. Learn about what Kevin Kelly calls the quantified self. Pay attention to your body and your mind. And look at transhumanism as an idea that has legs and can offer new ways of looking at where we are and what we could become. Mm -hmm. Natasha Vittemore, thank you very much for taking time to be with us today. Thank you. Yeah.